I'm not a futurist of the markets, so I'll leave that to the uh, FT experts in the room for you guys to tell us where to put our money. Um, I'm not a futurist of what the next cool digital device will be or what the next cool piece of social media will be, but I do focus on the future of designing and making things. And um, Autodesk is a really great place to do that. Uh, we're incubating a lot of new ideas. And some of you may be aware that we also launched an investment fund focused on the 3D printing ecosystem, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but before I even dive into the presentation, I did want to pick up on the thread of the conversation that just happened, of talking about innovation and manufacturing 4.0, and where is this next wave of innovation going to come from on connected devices, um, industrial internet. And I can say that uh, in my position as, as a director of our investment fund, that there's probably been two to three dozen companies in Silicon Valley over the last six months that have been pitching on these ideas. So it's happening. And I think what they lack, however, is the strength that you have in Europe and the UK is the, the industrial base and the knowledge of advanced manufacturing. So a lot of these startups, they may be individuals that came out of manufacturing companies, but don't have really the depth and breadth of expertise that you have here. So, but what they have on their side is quick movement, right? They're not belabored by a slower pace. So if you can marry those two things together, and I think this is why GE built their innovation center in Silicon Valley, so that you can kind of pick up on this pace of innovation. Things don't wait in Silicon Valley, right? I just flew in from San Francisco yesterday. It's all about movement. It's all about fluidity. So somehow, if you can bring those things together, you've got a beautiful, beautiful magic happening. What I'm going to talk about a bit is this idea of really compiling matter and what is going to happen in the future of making things, how we're going to design these things, and how they'll actually be produced. So imagine that you're a big manufacturer or a big design firm, and one of your new employees comes in, and their first job is to design this crazy thing. Say, hey, we need you to draw this and analyze it. So they're like, oh shit, man, this is gonna take me forever. I mean, look how many pieces there are in this thing. So they spend a week, maybe two weeks drawing this, and as soon as they bring it up to you and they're really proud of it, you say, oh, wait a minute, we're on a new design rev. You need to redraw it. And they're like, man. It's going to take me another two weeks to redraw this thing, and then you're going to tell me I have to change it again. Well, you may see that these forms are not really something that a human would come up with, right? These crazy, intricate structures, and we even have some samples in the booth outside. It's because the machine is actually drawing these things for us. And this is all about how do we teach machines to generate designs for us so that we don't explicitly draw them, which is kind of the old school way, right? You have an idea in your head for those engineers or designers in the audience and you sketch that idea out, and then you iterate through that. This is all about driving iterations on the path to find an optimal solution. Well, we're beyond what humans are capable of doing for our next generation of products. Products move too quickly, designs change too quickly, and now we have manufacturing capabilities that allow us to actually produce these things, which is really kind of what's changed in the last, I would say, decade. So how do we actually do this? How do we teach our machines? Now, you can't have a cool presentation without cat pictures, so I've got a lot of them. I got that check in the box. Somebody mentioned you know, a little company called Google that's figured out how to do machine learning pretty well, and they bought a ton of AI companies, uh, one of which is actually based here in London. And I don't know how many of you regularly use their image search. If you give presentations, you probably use it all the time, because I haven't yet done a presentation where I didn't use Google image search. There's something called reverse image search, though. So you don't search for an image by a keyword. You upload an image, and it finds other images that look like it. So I found my likeness in Grumpy Cat, and a lot of people think that I look like this, but really we're just thinking, right? That's our pondering, our pondering look. But if you put in a picture of Grumpy Cat, it finds a lot of other pictures of things that look like Grumpy Cat. And it's doing this solely based on the image. Nothing about the metadata or the tag or any user-driven information. And it's using machine learning to do this. The thing is, we didn't tell it what a cat looked like or what a grumpy cat looked like. It figured out what a grumpy cat looked like by analyzing billions and billions of images. It teaches itself how to recognize this, and it also ranks itself so it can improve its performance over time. In fact, the original developers of this, the, these machine learning algorithms cannot necessarily recognize the code that the machine generates. It sometimes performs better than they anticipated. And the only way they can tell you how it performed that well is to reverse engineer the code that the machine generated. Interesting, right? Maybe a little scary. So I'm going to postpone the doomsday scenario and the, the, the Terminator, which I think is inevitable. Um, that's how this all ends, right? It's all robots. 
But the point being is that we have very advanced machine learning algorithms that are being used all over the place already. And if you go down, uh, if you land in San Francisco airport at SFO and drive into the city, you'll see about 25 billboards that are all AI-focused companies, right? So this thing is happening. It's happening very quickly. Now, what it required was having a lot of data, right? Without that, the machine can't learn. It needs lots of information. With 3D design now, we have this product called Fusion 360, which is in the cloud. So people are designing, their information is in the cloud, and we can aggregate a lot of this information. So we can start to learn over time what is being designed. I mean, you think in your companies, how many times have your people redesigned the same thing over and over again? How many times has a bracket been designed in the human race? Right? How many millions of times have we redesigned that? So we have the opportunity here to not replicate that effort. By capturing this information, we now have the database from which a machine can start learning. Now, the next question is, well, how do you search this? Right? You can't necessarily just keyword search because there's a lot of things that we don't have necessarily names for. So we figured out a way that we can actually search by shape. Right? So we use nothing but the shape or topology of the object itself, and we can find other objects that are very similar to it. All right? We don't use, again, metadata or any text. This is only the shape of the thing. And what you're seeing on the screen is not a Petri dish of bacteria. These are actually groupings of search results. So each of these little strings or threads that you see are actually groups of similar shaped objects. So if you zoom in on one of those, this is what you'll see. So this analyzed a whole bunch of designs, and it said, hey, all of these elements seem to be the same. And as you can see, they're all gears. They all have a hole in them. They all have gears on the outside. So the machine learning algorithm figured out what a gear is. Now, it has no idea the function of a gear, but it does know what a gear is. And importantly, it knows what a gear is typically connected to. So if you start designing this shape, it might say, hey, would you like to draw a gear? And you're like, yes, I would. And if you have a gear, it's like, well, would you like to draw a shaft? Yes, I would. Would you like to draw a pulley to connect a belt to? So you can see it has now a design graph, which is what we call this, the graph of all the other components that a gear might be attached to. It's kind of like an autocomplete for 3D design, right? Now, this is in research phase, right? We call this design graph. There's a lot of work to be done on it, but we've actually made a lot of progress, and it's, it's uncanny of how well it can recognize something like a chair and find other chairs that look very similar to it. Although once in a while, it'll come up with like a big miss, like you'll have a chair and it'll show an elephant. So we're still working out the kinks on that. But this is where we're going, right? We're now applying machine learning algorithms to 3D design and to manufacturing. So does anyone recognize this image? This was something that uh, we've known about for a while, but really wasn't studied until recently by uh, a professor at Cambridge. These are actually the gears on the back of a leaf hopper in its larval state. So this is a baby leaf hopper, these little things they're all over the world. They jump from one leaf to the other, one blade of grass to another. Now, if you're going to jump from here to the equivalent of the back of the room, from one blade of grass to the other, you better be pretty accurate in your trajectory. Well, the problem is the larval state of these insects, they don't have enough neurons to fire both of their legs at exactly the same time. One will fire and the other will fire a millisecond after that. It would put it off course. So over the course of evolution, it developed these gears so that both legs fire simultaneously. We thought, as humans, we invented gears. Nature figured it out a long, long, long time ago, right? It went through billions and billions of random mutations and found that this solution worked out really well. What's even cooler about this thing is it only exists in the larval state. As it develops and matures and it grows more neurons, it has the capacity to actually fire both legs. And in fact, when it gets stronger, it has a tendency to break these gears. So it actually sheds these gears. It molts over time. Pretty cool solution. So how do we tap into that idea? How do we tap into the idea that we as humans may not know the best solution? How do we teach a machine to go through and, and basically run artificial evolution using the power of the cloud and computation to try out millions or billions of ideas to figure out what is the best idea? So here's a case study of a company called Lightning Motorcycle. They're in Silicon Valley. They built an electric motorcycle. And as a, as a rider myself, I'm like, yeah, electric, you know, I don't want to just cruise around town. Like, I want to go fast. This thing goes to 108 miles an hour. It's winning races all over the place. So we helped them redesign this thing called the swing arm, which basically attaches the rear wheel to the chassis. And the suspension attaches to it. And it's kind of an important piece. You don't want it to break when you're going around a turn. 
but they wanted to make it lighter weight. This is how it's made now. It's made out of three pieces of aluminum. You have one in the middle, one on each side. So it's the traditional problem in subtractive manufacturing. You start off with this huge block of expensive material and you cut away 90% of it to yield your product. So we thought, well, how can we make this lighter weight, stronger, and not waste that much material? And actually make it cost less. So we started by actually defining the constraints of the problem, not by drawing the answer. So the constraints means, well, how does it attach? Where does it attach, right? We have a hinge joint on the front, We've got a place where the suspension comes in, and in the back we have the axle running through. So these are fixed geometries that we can't change. So we say, hey, machine, here's the fixed areas. Don't change that. Also, machine, here's the loads that we can expect when it goes through a turn, when it breaks, when it accelerates. The swing arm goes through a lot of interesting kind of torsional um, load conditions. So it's a pretty fun endeavor for finite element analysis. So we gave it all this information. And then we said, okay, start doing iterations. Start cutting away material where we don't need it anymore. So we went through topology optimization to find out where there's no loads, take away that material. And you end up with this pretty funky looking thing that a human probably wouldn't come up with on our own. That's not something that your engineers or designers would probably sketch out on a piece of paper when they draw a swing arm. For one thing, it's really hard to draw. The thing is, we didn't only do it once. We did this hundreds of thousands of times and analyzed each one and what's Amazing, what enables this to happen is the fact that we can do this about three times a second in the cloud. So instead of using one processor and doing a serial production, we actually split it up across thousands of processors. Five minutes, she's waving at me. So we can do this hundreds of thousands of times and find an optimal solution. What's interesting is how do you actually, as a designer, choose which one is the best solution? So you may have some that are more or less equal, and then there's this human quality of figuring out, well, what is the best design? And this is a big challenge in terms of user interface and actually interacting with the designer. The designer is still in control of this process. And how do you make sure that they're aware of the trade-offs of choosing one design over the other? Now, the ultimate result, it's interesting. I don't know if you guys recognize these two on the bottom. So the top was actually the optimal design, and that's the 3D printed version of it. These other two things are actually a pelvis from a cat and a dog. Uncannily similar, right? I mean, this process, because it is sim simulating essentially an evolutionary process, we end up with very organic looking shapes. So we need to suspend our belief about what these things should look like. That's something that, as humans, we'll probably have to adapt to, I would imagine, in the next generation of design. Now, what enables all this stuff to happen is 3D printing. There's really no other way to, to manufacture this efficiently. 3D printing is getting real. You can see this hip cup implant um, on the table outside. This lattice structure inside was all generatively created, right? So again, a human didn't draw it, the machine drew it. And it's, it's created like that to create a porous structure that bone can grow into. So it actually combines with your body rather than having this binary situation within your body. And there's all kinds of interesting applications that we're going through now. We're actually working with Joris Larman Group or MX3D in the Netherlands to control robots that are basically welding, making a 3D printer out of a robot, in order to produce a bridge. And you guys may have seen this. This is actually set to be done in 2017, where we're going to plop two robots on a canal in Amsterdam, give it a bunch of metal, and they're going to print a bridge. And as they're printing it, they're going to move out on it. They're going to print some more and move out on it some more. No humans. Now, I imagine, in reality, a human's going to have to go out there once in a while. But this is a grand experiment, and it is going to be a functional bridge that people walk over. The thing is, again, the designs that we're generating for this are done by the machine. It's probably not something that you would assume uh, a human designer would come up with. So this is the kind of stuff we can expect to see in the not-too-distant future. Real things, real functional things. So in order to accelerate all of this, uh, we created an investment fund. So we set aside $100 million dollars to invest in the 3D printing ecosystem. So for Autodesk, that ecosystem involves the materials, the machines, as well as the software and the services that you can provide out of it. So it's not just the 3D printer that sits on someone's desk or in the factory. This is that entire embodiment. And really, you think about it, is the IP in the material that's being placed by the machine, is the IP in the machine itself, or is it in the software that's telling the machine where to put the material? And the reality is that the best companies that we've seen are doing a little bit of all three, because they realize if you take away one component, you don't have anything. All right? So it's that trilogy, that intersection 
of hardware materials and software. This is a company that we, we just invested in recently. Um, they came out of Jennifer Lewis's lab at Harvard where they're printing conductive ink, right? So they have their own machine, they have their own um, material, and they can actually print the traces inside of the 3D printed structure itself. So you don't have to constrict it to a 2D plane now of having a circuit board. It can't print yet the LEDs or the motors, but they're working on it. And then when you're done, you know, you can place the circuit board as the thing is printed. And basically you can print a drone that just flies right off the print bed. So this is where we're going, right? Multiple material capabilities. This isn't just solid plastic chunks anymore. This is putting what material you want exactly where you want it. That's the difference with additive manufacturing. Now, we can also start creating new materials that have never existed before. So this is the idea of computational materials that's in the title of the presentation. So traditional materials we see here, if we look at the density of it versus the stiffness of it, um, we have metals, which are you know, very stiff, but also tend to be very dense and quite heavy, even titanium. Polymers, we get into carbon fibers, which do much, much better in being strong, stiff, and lightweight. But there's a limit of what natural materials will do. So we've created this new computationally derived generation of architected materials. This is something that was done at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. They created these stretch dominated lattices. So basically these are microstructures that instead of bending, they work in compression and, and tension, which engineers would understand as a much more efficient way. And we're actually compiling this. And I say compiling, not printing, because really it's, it's more akin to compiling code, right? You take this design, you compile it into a 3D printed physical object. And we're doing this down at you know, the tens, tens of micron scale. So this stuff is becoming real. Now, we're limited to the total size that we can print at this scale, but this is starting to happen now. And what's interesting is they've actually printed a metal that has a negative coefficient of thermal expansion, meaning when you heat up the metal, it shrinks. And when you cool it down, it expands. All right, the universe is what, four and a half billion years old? A metal has never existed in the universe that would shrink when you heat it up. This is something that's entirely computationally driven. It's something that's new today, and we can expect to see more of it. So we're actually doing this, right? We're actually printing these parts that are going on to automobiles and aircraft, and, and it, they're kind of coming in opportunistically, wherever there's a high value part and relatively low volume that can take advantage of being lighter weight or stiffer. Now the thing is, we have to realize the challenge is both one, human capabilities. It's hard for an engineer to look at a structure like this and intuit how it's going to break. And it's kind of important on an aircraft for us to understand how the thing's going to fail and likely modes of failure. How do you inspect something like this with this much surface area and this, this surface roughness? Well, we were actually able in this with hundreds of little struts in a tensile test to predict in the computational model exactly where it would break in the real physical thing. So we can kind of turn that inspection issue on its head and say, well, why don't we design the things specifically to fail in a certain way? So when you go to inspect it, you can just look at this one little node and see if it's broken. If it has, maybe it's already gone through 20,000 fatigue cycles and it's time to replace it. So we can actually use this to our advantage. Instead of trying to shoehorn this into traditional manufacturing processes, traditional standards, we have an opportunity now to create new ways of analyzing our materials and seeing if that they're in end of life. This also, we've heard the conversation come up a lot about security today. Adrian talked about it. Um, Benoit talked about it. It's, it's a big topic conversation. We think about the Internet of Things. You know, two months ago, somebody hacked a car and took remote control of a car. They could steer it. They could break it without the driver actually having any control over it. All right? That's just the tip of the iceberg. What happens when we're compiling at the micron scale of material and somebody hacks your design, not to steal it, but to actually intentionally misplace material inside of it, to cause failure at a very inopportune time. Maybe you could design it so that at the 10,000th fatigue cycle, it breaks, right? Now, not to throw a doomsday scenario into your minds, but meaning this discussion around security is real. Once we get into this age of compiling materials, people can now alter the literal physical atoms in your product without you knowing it. Right, so this is becoming a much bigger issue. Um, happy, do we have time to answer questions? Thank you very much. Talk soon.